Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is David Thoreau, and I'm the president of the Independent Institute. We're so delighted to welcome you all to our special program with our friend Tucker Carlson. the sworn enemy of lying, pomposity, smugness, and groupthink. And he'll be speaking, um, we believe, uh, regarding his new number one New York Times best-selling book, Ship of Fools. <laughs> How a selfish ruling class is bringing America to the brink of revolution. For those of you new to the Independent Institute, you can find information on the printed program that hopefully everyone received. The Independent Institute is a nonprofit, nonpartisan public policy research organization. We sponsor in depth studies of major social and economic issues. We have about 140 fellows. And the purpose of this is to boldly advance peaceful, prosperous, and free societies commit with a commitment to human worth and dignity. In the process, we seek robust dialogue on key issues, and we stand against efforts to, show, to shut down the free exchange of ideas, and Tucker, of course, is a leader in doing that. The results of our work are published as books and other publications and form the basis for numerous conference and media programs. Neither accept, accepting or seeking government funding, we hope that you'll all join with us as a member of the Lighthouse Society. Uh, before I begin, however, I want to thank our board member, Dr. David Teese, who's here tonight. David is chairman and CEO of the Berkeley Research Group and the Thomas Tuscher Professor of Business at the University of California at Berkeley, my alma mater. David provided the wonderful, beautiful wines from New Zealand that we've been enjoying this evening. So I want to thank David in particular. In his work, Tucker Carlson has been sounding a clarion call regarding America's elites, a group whose status, wealth, and blind belief in government power have grown beyond imagination, even as the rest of society has floundered. 77, 1776 book, The Wealth of Nations, Adam Smith refuted the mercantilist system of government privileges. As a result, and under the leadership of the businessmen Richard Cobden and John Bright, the so-called Manchester League movement of working class people arose, swept into power, and abolished mercantilism, unleashing entrepreneurial freedom in markets that uplifted the lives of the entire British nation. Today, under the secular religion of progressivism, the people have run America for many, many decades and profit from neo-mercantilism, now barely interact with America. Indeed, they despise it. In his book, Ship of Fools, Tucker offers a blistering critique of this ruling class, or what the political scientist Angelo Cotavia calls America's political class. Traditional liberals who, as civil libertarians, once defended free speech and due process have been replaced by authoritarians whose hard edge agenda and unhinged identity politics is now on parade for all to see. In the process, they'll not hesitate to fleece you while lecturing you about bathrooms, plastic straws, and safe places. <laughs> Left and right, Tucker says, are no longer meaningful categories in America. The rift between those who benefit from the status quo and those who don't. Our leaders are fools, Tucker concludes, quote, unaware that they are captains of a sinking ship, unquote. In his signature fearless and witty style, Tucker is addressing the all-important question, how do we put the country back on course? And Americans are indeed listening now. Tucker Carlson is the host, as you all know, of Tucker Carlson Tonight on the Fox News Channel. I first had the pleasure of working with Tucker when he was on the editorial staff for the journal Policy Review years ago at the Heritage Foundation. He has since flown and was host of MSNBC Tucker program Tucker. He was co-host of CNN's Crossfire and Spin Room. 
and he is co-founder and former editor-in-chief of The Daily Caller. Also author of the book, Politics, Partisans, and Parasites, My Adventures in Cable News. <laughs> He's a recipient of the Warren Brooks Award for Excellence in Journalism, and you can read more about his background in the program. But I will simply add that he was born in San Francisco and raised in California. So please enjoy. So please join with me in welcoming Tucker Carlson. Well, thank you, David. That was so nice. I'm definitely, I'm definitely from California. And it's, uh, it's just so nice and also sort of bewildering uh, to be here. Every time I come back to the state, I, I think, I, mean, I grew up in this state, the proudest person, the proudest Californian maybe ever. And I grew up in a family from this state that came here in the 1850s and literally never stopped talking about how great the state was, how great they were actually also. Um, but it was sort of a nonstop barrage of propaganda for my entire childhood about how basically anyone who didn't live here was unfortunate. Um, don't tell them because they might move here, was the view. Um, but we really considered California Eden. Uh, I did, for sure. I was born here, as David just said, Children's Hospital on California Street, lived in Pacific Heights, moved um, to LA and then La Jolla, and never thought I would leave. One of the many lists, of the many things I never thought I would do. Um, I never thought I'd be up here defending 1970s liberalism, like <laughs> free speech and due process. <laughs> what? I never thought I would think of myself as a civil libertarian. I never understood why civil liberties might matter, or I never understood that maybe the threat to speech might come from large corporations like Google. That never entered my mind, ever. Um, a lot of things never entered my mind, um, but it's a completely different country from the one I grew up in, um, and so some of my assumptions have changed. And let me just say, by the way, what a deep pleasure it is to be in a room full of normal people. I mean, this really is, this is, no, I'm not kidding. One of the, and I, I have a million, obviously, relatives in California, and, you know, they're all from this area. They all went to Cal. To hear people from, you know, Piedmont and Alameda and Oakland, where my grandmother grew up, it's just so weird and nice, and it just reminds me of how I grew up. I mean, this among people like you, so, ah, it's very reassuring, um, I would say, uh, to know that that California still exists. Um, but I wrote this book because I started brooding. I mean, I host a daily show at Fox, and I have four kids and two dogs and, like, a lot going on. The sort of last thing I want to do is write a book since they're, they're really hard to write. And I felt a moral obligation to write it myself, um, which is not the way you sort of do it in TV. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> it's like you see someone with a cable show who's doing, you know, Alexander Hamilton's fiscal policy explained. Probably didn't write it. Okay, just throwing that out there. Um, <laughs> But I actually wanted to write this because I found myself brooding on a single question. And I'm hardly an intellectual or a profound abstract thinker. I mean, I'm literally a talk show host, okay? So I don't want to kind of pretend that I'm something I'm not. And by the way, I should say, um, this book is not a sort of populist war cry, as it's been described by people. I'm not a populist. I mean, I'm literally from Pacific Heights, La Jolla, and Georgetown, so it's not like I'm, I'm here to give you the view from coal country or something. I'm not, you know what I mean? Um, I'm not going to pose. Uh, but the question that I couldn't get over was, why did America elect Donald Trump? And it's one of those questions. So I covered the campaign, and then immediately after the campaign, got a nightly show. And so I didn't have that much time to stand back from it to sort of consider this. But it was such a glaring question, because it was such an unexpected outcome, that I expected at some point it would be the topic of national conversation. How did this happen? I, whether you're for it or not. And if, you know, I work at Fox, so I, I actually agree with a lot of what Trump says. That doesn't make his election any less remarkable. It was totally unexpected by everyone, including him. <laughs> no, it's just true. It's not, right? I mean, like, nobody expected this. So where I live in Northwest DC, Washington DC, not the state, you know, um, this was deeply unwelcome news. <laughs> I mean, people really don't like Trump. You think they don't like him in the Bay Area. You don't think they don't like him at Presidio Heights. You should go come to where I live, which is 96% for Hillary Clinton. And the rest for like the weed party or something. Our, no, our third party candidates 
outperformed Trump, every single one of them. So Donald Trump is the nightmare of my neighbors. All of them, including the three Republicans in my zip code. <laughs> Idi Amin would get a warmer welcome in our dog park. I'm not, no, no exaggeration. So they were completely horrified. I was on the set in Fox in New York on election night and my next door neighbor, whom I love, who's a kind of moderate, actually pretty conservative Democrat, worked for Bill Clinton as a consultant, has been successful, very good guy. Um, and really on the moderate end, the conservative end, especially on the social issues, you would all like him, um, of the Democratic Party, texted me to say, we're leaving. And I said, where are you going? He said, no, we're leaving permanently. And I said, are you gonna sell your house? He goes, I don't know, we're just leaving. You know, we're going to New Zealand. I said, well, can I use your pool uh, when you're gone? I didn't really. It's hard to take, as someone who covers campaigns, it's sort of hard to take the hysteria too seriously because it's a perennial event. We're going to have another election, right? And if you don't like the outcome this time, presumably you can change the outcome next time, right? That's our system. So it's not really the end of the world. It's the changing temporarily of the guard. And that's okay. It's happened before. People I don't care for have won elections. And I didn't abandon my house, right, in response. But that was really their feeling. And it was a mixture, it was a conventional stages of grief thing. You know, they felt deeply threatened by Trump personally. They could not control Trump. That was really the key to what I realized later. He was not recognizable to them. It wasn't that he was some right winger. He wasn't actually. He wasn't even really a Republican. So for, for generations, for my whole life, you would hear from the left, you know, growing up here, I would always hear this, if the right ever takes charge, they're, you know, they're going to impose a theocracy. Yeah. You know, Jerry Falwell will be president. You remember that? <laughs> and you know, the only person I ever met growing up who went to church was our housekeeper. No, no, no I'm serious. Like I grew up in a totally, I mean, I was baptized at Grace Cathedral actually by my uncle, the bishop. And that was kind of the last time I appeared in church. You know, until I was an adult. So the left was very concerned that the right was comprised of these snake handlers from deep in Alabama somewhere <laughs> who were going to impose a kind of Old Testament version of government on the rest of us. But when it really happened, we got kind of the opposite, actually. Trump is not a theocrat, not to blow your minds. In fact, a friend of mine did the famous interview with him where he asked Trump, you know, what's your favorite book of the Bible? And Trump goes, well, the Bible. And my friend said, no, 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 but like, what's your favorite book of the Bible? And Trump kind of narrowed his eyes because he knew it was a trick question. And he goes, the Bible, okay? <laughs> totally unaware there are component books within. So we didn't get a theocrat. And we didn't get someone who was rigorously loyal to the sort of talking points of institutional conservatism. That's for sure. Not even familiar with some of them. So we got something very different from what they feared, and they hated him more. <laughs> Why? It's kind of interesting, why? Because he's so right, no. Because they could not control him and because his message was aimed at them. That's what it was really about, at them. When he said, in effect, look around. Is the country richer than it was before the financial crash? No, drive from DC to Pittsburgh. You drive through towns with 10,000 people who don't have a car dealership. And it's certainly true in this state, drive through the sun, I have a lot of family in ag to this day. They're doing great, by the way. The Bowles family, great people, but drive to where they live. And you drive through, Victor Davis Hanson, we have on all the time yeah. from up here. It's a wonderful man. Is this sixth generation Central Valley farm family. You know, he lives in the same house that his great great grandfather lived in. And there's deep poverty around him in a way that wasn't there a generation ago. So even as our coastal financial centers and, of course, our political center, Washington, have thrived, the rest of the country has withered in measurable ways. And Trump's message was basically that. Not everyone has benefited equally. Again, because I'm not, you know what I mean? Because I'm very much a product of the world I'm writing about. I thought, well, that's kind of a, you know, you're right. You're making a good point. So he was aiming his message at them and the system from which they were benefiting. And so they were horrified, and I get that. What I don't understand is why they never paused for one second to ask why this happened. That is a bizarre reaction. I don't care how horrible and unexpected an event is, at some point you ask yourself why it happened, particularly if it happened to you. Because the obvious question was, am I implicated in this? Did I do something to cause this? 
If you wake up and your wife has run off with the mailman, and he weighs 70 pounds more than you and makes half as much, obviously your first reaction is, she's horrible. How could she do that? It's her fault. But at a certain point, you think to yourself, well, wait a second. If I was such a good husband, why would she do that? Maybe I did something wrong. That's what a normal, self-aware, decent person, at some point, would ask himself. I didn't expect this to happen. It did happen. I didn't welcome it happening. How can I prevent it from happening? I'd like to get remarried. Maybe I won't repeat the mistakes that caused wife number one to run off with the fat mailman. <laughs> Trump is that mailman. <laughs> and the voters are his new wife. That's what happened. But what's so remarkable is that the abandoned husband thinks he's totally blameless. In fact, you know what? Putin made a run off with the mailman. That is really what's going on. We are watching, and I unfortunately am living firsthand, this kind of very predictable psychological phenomenon of guilt transference where the people who did this absolutely refuse to entertain the prospect that they're in any way culpable for it happening. It wasn't me, it was them. Or it was voters, that's my favorite explanation. It was voters, voters did this. Why? Well, because they're racist, duh. <laughs> or they're just, they're horrible, they're just immoral. And I thought, well, you know, I don't know. I mean, it's a, America's a cross-section like any group of people. But I covered the campaign. I never met a single person who, you know, saw the Access Hollywood tape and said, you know what, he speaks for me. I was kind of on the fence until this came out, and I realized, that's my guy, right there. <laughs> People didn't vote for Trump because of his shortcomings. They voted for him in spite of those shortcomings in order that his election would send a crystal clear message to the people in charge, and not just of our political system, but also of our economic institutions, our cultural institutions, our education system, the sentences system, the ongoing scam that we're all participating in, where we spend 60 grand a year to have our kids hate us and the values that made this all possible. <laughs> I have four of them, so don't get me going. <laughs> all of the people controlling the levers of power are implicated, including, I mean, the media. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm part of that too. So my fear is, my honest, and this is a sincere fear, is it that they won't get the message and won't seek to remedy the underlying problems that gave rise to the populism we're living through right now. I just want to say it again for the third time. I'm not for populism. I think Trump was a needed message to the people in charge. I agree with about nine, much more than I ever thought I would of his message, much more. But I also recognize that political turmoil hurts the country long term. Or another way to put it would be, the only reason that we have such a robust economy and a vibrant civil society and have for 250 years, minus four, where we had some conflict, but the only reason we have all these things that make us the place everyone else wants to move is because we have had, for centuries, this stable political system upon which all these other things were built. We built them because we didn't have to worry about everything changing in Washington dramatically. And that really is the difference between us and other places. We have a stable political system, therefore we can build a great civilization. You don't, therefore you can't. I mean, that is the difference in a lot of ways. I went to Venezuela as a kid, Caracas. And it was a like, pretty nice place, actually. And the Venezuelans, and don't let anyone lie to you, totally impressive. You know, huge middle class by regional standards in 1980. Capable, well-educated people. By the way, they're all in Miami, thriving. <laughs> it's not like they didn't have human capital in Venezuela, are you kidding? They had way more than a lot of other countries in the region. Natural resources, yeah, check. Largest known oil reserves, yeah, they had that. What they also had was an economic system that excluded a huge percentage of the population, which is the rule, by the way, through human history, okay? And one of the things that I always hated about liberals, they're always whining about unfairness, which for the last 40 years I've always thought, well, that's baked in the cake because life is unfair. Whining about it is like a college dorm room exercise. It doesn't, you know what I mean? Is it gonna get you anywhere? What I didn't understand was that unfairness only works if you don't give everyone the vote. 
Democracy is the new ingredient in this formula. And that's what I think we don't spend enough time thinking about. I couldn't be a greater proponent of democracy. I think it is actually the key to our stability. The idea that if you don't like the system, you can change it peacefully by voting is what keeps us from volatility. It's what keeps us from storming the Bastille or torching the police station or acting like Portland, Oregon. <laughs> Sorry, no, I actually love Portland. It's sad. Um, so I'm pro-democracy. But if you have democracy, which, by the way, has not been tried very often throughout human history, we went from like the Roman Republic till our revolution with no democracy. So it's not like there's a long track record of it working. There isn't. Common sense tells you if you have a democracy, if you give every person an equal franchise in your political system a vote, then you have to make sure that they at least feel enfranchised in other ways. In other words, if you give everyone the vote, you can't tell people to just shut up and obey because you will infuriate them and they will punish you by electing a populist to get your attention. And if you continue to not pay attention, they'll elect another and another. And you may not perceive it's happening because these populists will arise under the cloak of some ideology or other. So in Venezuela, people woke up and they're like, wait, wait a second, nine families control the entire economy, let's elect Hugo Chavez. And the rest of us looked at this and said, oh wow, why is socialism resurging in Latin America? I thought we all knew that didn't work. Look at Cuba, it didn't work. What we missed was that's not socialism, it's populism. It's exactly what that was. You, know, they could, you can dress it up under you know, whatever kind of headline you want. But the truth is, that is a howl of rage from people who feel like they don't have a stake in the society. You need to keep people enfranchised in your society. We're all in this together. And the way you do that in a normal country is with a vibrant, self-sustaining, independent middle class. That's, that's the only circumstance under which you can have a functioning democracy, is if you have the majority of the country is bourgeoisie. You know, they're, they're sort of normal, working people who feel like their kids might do a little better than they are doing. If you cease to have that, wow, you can wind up with something very bad. And that's exactly what happened in Caracas, where they're now eating zoo animals and have no toilet paper. It's bad. So I don't think it's going to happen here, but I also think Trump is a warning sign to the rest of us that you need to address the core economic issues that underlie all of this. And I'm not certain of the answers because, again, I'm just a talk show host but I'm pretty good at diagnosing obvious problems, and this is an obvious problem. So in 2015, the middle class ceased to be a majority in this country for the first time in over 100 years. I mean, to the extent that we can even know that. To the extent, you know, accurate records about wages have been kept. It's always been a majority middle class country. It stopped being one in 2015, so I'm thinking, what was I doing in 2015? Oh, I was on TV every day. As a news guy, presumably I would have caught that news, no. No one noticed, because we're busy arguing about bathrooms or some other sort of distraction. We're busy listening to some other bloviating demagogue, you know, make racial attacks on some group. Ah, it's white men. We're, okay. And, and I thought to myself, well, maybe all of that stuff is a cover, a distraction, for the real conversation that we ought to be having, which is what do you do for normal people? And I mean literally normal people. I mean, people, you know, that, like, don't live in our, you know, like, let's say you make 70 grand a year and have an IQ of 100 and three kids. That's like a normal person. Your society should be structured in such a way that that person can thrive. Not because I've ever met that person, but a country is based on that person. And without that per if that person thinks that his kids are going to be in much worse shape than he is and there's no hope for them, that person's scary. Right? It's one step from there to nihilism. So you need to organize your society so that guy is okay. I mean, this is like a basic concept. In fact, we had an entire political party based on that concept for like 80 years. It was called the Democratic Party. Remember that? I was never a member of it. I had contempt for them. I thought they were silly. But looking back, it was good to have that party. That party doesn't exist. That party represents two groups, the very rich and the people wholly dependent on government. That is part of the re realignment we're now watching. And I see it in my own family. I mean, I have relatives who, you know, on the affluent side, they've you know, voted Republican since, well, Lincoln, like since it started. A friend of mine who's a Democratic pollster always says they had a name for his whole career. He's almost 60 among pollsters of both parties for college-educated white Americans. They were called Republicans. 
It was the other word for them because they voted overwhelmingly Republican. And now, of course, if you go through Presidio Heights, in fact, my cousin lives there, right on, you know those houses that are right on Presidio? You can picture that in one of those. And she's screaming right winger, whoa, love her. Uh, she says she's the only one in her zip code that she's aware of who voted for Donald Trump. No, I mean, I'm, 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 think about that. My grandparents lived right there, right there. On one side, on the other side, they lived on Green Street and Pacific Heights, you know, nice neighborhoods. I mean, they wouldn't consider voting Democrat. Remember when Democrats said the Republican Party is the country club party, and the Republicans would be like, that's not true. It was totally true, let's be honest. It was totally true, okay? It was. Completely true. We used to scoff at it, poolside at the country club. <laughs> well, that's not true. Ugh. Bring me another bourbon. <laughs> it's ridiculous. Anyway, that was totally true. What happened is that the affluent, people who are benefiting under our totally brand new economic rules, brand new economic rules, where labor is basically irrelevant, the value of labor shrunk to like nothing, okay? So people in the knowledge or digital economy, whatever we're calling it, and then the service economy at the other side, they all went to the Democratic Party. So that left what? Everyone else. Those normal people, the middle class, remember that, wage earners? So the Republican Party, if smart, would have said, well, wait a second, this is a math question. If we just lost our base, you know what I mean? Like everyone at the club, all of my, everyone I went to school with, they're all Democrats now, a ton of my relatives too, offensively, makes for a very difficult Thanksgiving. <laughs> all those people have moved, to, and I'm sure some of your children, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Do you know what I mean? You send them to Thatcher and Stanford, you think they're gonna be conservative? I knew, wrong. Sorry if, that, sorry if that's too close to the bone. Um, but the other party might say, well, wait a second, maybe we take everybody else. But honestly, I'm the, I live there, so I can just tell you, and I know everybody in this world, because that's what I do. Their reaction was, what? The American middle class, no? We're blackballing them in membership committee, like no chance are we letting them in. And the only reason the Republican Party, what you're watching is a realignment where the Republican Party becomes the middle class party. And Trump's singular contribution to this whole thing was forcing that. He's a blunt instrument. I mean, he's a Viking. I'm serious. He showed up at the Republican Party, you know, like long hair, matted beard. He torched all their huts. He slayed their livestock. I'm not kidding, he carried their women over his shoulder back to his longboat and rode back to Norway. I mean, he really pillaged the Republican Party and with him came hordes of middle-class people. So all of a sudden, if you're, if you're wondering what all the drama is and all the kind of, it's like, you know, Episcopalian Christmas dinner where there's lots of unspoken resentment and it takes a very high level of drunkenness for it to come out. You know what I mean? What are you thinking about, honey? You never love me! I know you know nothing about that, but, um, I've lived it. If that's what's going on in the Republican Party right now. There's all this anger. So, you know, on stage, Paul Ryan, Speaker of the House, is like, oh yeah, Donald Trump, I love Donald Trump. Ah, you know what I mean? <laughs> hates Donald Trump. Donald Trump hates him. What's that really about? That's what it's about. It's changing the composition and the orientation of a major American political party. It's not easy. And because it's the Republican Party, it's taking place sort of in this passive-aggressive way. Um, but the outlines will be very clear, I would say, two or three election cycles from now. And by the way, that's a good thing. It's a good thing. Parties in, the, and I'll stop with this and take your hostile questions, but parties, well, I'll keep going. No, I'm sorry, I'm just, I, I get into free association mode and you don't even wanna go there, but the point is, parties only exist, literally, oh, I'm not overstating it, they literally only exist to represent their voters. Uh, New Hampshire primary. I'm sitting getting a haircut at the Metropolitan Club, this men's club in D.C. where I go for lunch with my dad and my brother. Great place, very staid. And I go in to get my haircut, and I said to the barber, there's nobody here. Where is everybody? And he's like, oh, they're in New Hampshire for Jeb, of course. Like the entire club, like emptied out. And they all sort of took a day off from the law firm to fly up to Manchester to give it the old try for Jeb. Well, you know, she was fine. I'm not attacking Jeb. Well, that's kind of interesting. So I'm sitting there getting my hair cut. And this guy walks in who's actually a very well-known guy and a very good guy um, who's a Republican Party official and is kind of a 
moderate Republican stronghold in Washington, and uh, we're sitting, and I said, man, it looks like Trump is like, and I was leaving that day for Manchester, and he goes, looks like Trump's gonna do pretty well. He's like, what? I said, what if he gets the nomination? He goes, we can't get the nomination. And I said, I know, but what if he does? Like, you never know. I mean, it's a little weird. Donald Trump, the New York Post headline guy, is gonna be the nominee of the Republican Party, but like, it could happen. He goes, we won't, we're not gonna let that happen. And I said, well, what are you gonna do? He goes, we'll take it from the convention. And at the time, my thinking on this was evolving because, you know, I, I didn't catch a lot of this stuff. I'm just watching. And, but I remember saying to him, like, what do you mean you're going to take it from him? Is it really yours to take? Do, like, do you own the Republican nomination? Do you own the Republican Party? You're just some, I didn't say this out loud, but I was thinking you're just like some functionary who lives in my neighborhood. You don't own the party. It's voters own the party, don't they? Like, by definition, he's like, no, 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 we can't. We can't have Donald Trump as the nominee. <laughs> they never stopped thinking that, which again, I understand. I try to be an empathetic person. What I don't understand is why they don't understand the effect on the rest of the country of doing that. What you're basically saying to people is your worst fears are true. It'd be like going into your eight-year-old's room and being like, I'm sorry, Bobby, there actually is a monster under your, under your bed. <laughs> there is, those snuffling noises, that's totally real. It's not a scr tree scratching against the window, it's a monster with sharp teeth and pools of saliva waiting to eat you the second I leave. Just so you know, sleep tight. <laughs> that really is the message. So out there in the rest of the country, outside where I live, people are like, well, wait a second. They say it's a democracy, but I notice no matter who I vote for, no one ever does what I want them to do. Like, I'm not an extremist in immigration. Like, I'm for immigrants, but shouldn't you have control of your own borders? And if you don't, how are you a country exactly? You're not, it's a definitional question. Countries have territorial control of land, period. It doesn't mean you exclude everybody, it means you decide who comes, that's it. If I invite 10 people over to dinner at my house on Saturday night, it's called a dinner party. If 10 people I've never heard of show up and start eating my food, it's something very different. <laughs> it's not a dinner party. And if I say to them, leave, and they're like, shut up, racist. <laughs> then we have something very, very different, okay? And it's not something that you want, actually. And by the way, I'm totally happy to have 10 people over for dinner. I just want to have a say in who they are. So it's, it's not complex. And voters have been saying that precise thing to Washington, you know, only since 1965. You know, not that long. 51 years. And they totally ignored voters, completely ignored voters. And by the way, this is not an esoteric fact that I dug up in my journey through political science. These are publicly available polls you can pull up on what we call the internet. <laughs> They're available to anyone who's interested in what the public thinks. We know this conclusively. They've thought this for gener literally generations. Totally ignored. Same with trade. Nobody can test that trade generates prosperity. Of course it does. That's not even up for debate. What's up for debate is whether you should sign a trade deal in which the other signatories get to cheat without you saying anything about it. Well, who's for that exactly? Well, we are, turns out. So if you raise your hand and say, you know, I'm not against trade, but like, why is this good for us? Shut up. You don't understand. What, are you an economist now? Hmm? Hmm? Oh, yeah, did you work at McKinsey? Where's your HBS degree? You don't have one? Shh, adults are talking. And actually, it's kind of intimidating. As a non-expert, as a non-economist who like majored in Russian history and didn't even graduate, I'm like, oh yeah, it's econ you know. I don't even know how to pronounce it. Economics, I guess. Whatever, I don't know, you're right, you're totally right. Here's what I do know, BS. I'll never forget, I'll, I covered the NAFTA debate of 1994, and of course I was totally on the side of NAFTA because I'm on the side of progress and on the side of trade, actually, and I still am. But I'll never forget the one part of that debate that bothered me at the time and bothers me immensely now was the line, universal, from everyone I knew that this trade agreement will be good for everyone. There's no one who won't benefit from this. Now again, I'm demonstrably not an economist, okay? But I do pay attention to life. And I thought at the time, as I think now, that that is a lie by definition. If someone tells you that something is all good, that it's an unalloyed positive from which everyone will benefit, he's lying. And by the way, if you wake up and you find something that is all good, you are dead, actually. <laughs> and you have gone to a better place. But in this temporal existence, nothing is all good. Everything is a mixed blessing. It's somewhat better than it is not. 
Then you try to go for the thing that's better than not better, okay? But that's as good as you're going to get. Here's the problem. Continuously lying about the effects of policies to the public that pays for those policies and has to live their consequences creates deep and profound resentment. If you tell people this is going to happen and it doesn't happen and you tell them that enough, they're really mad. If you think you're getting a pony for Christmas and you get a bag of hair, you never forget it. <laughs> you're telling your therapist about it 30 years later, okay? And that's what we've done. I understand. But what's infuriating, and this is the last, my last sentence, and critically, what will ensure future cycles of volatility, cycles that we should all be concerned about, is the unwillingness of policymakers to admit any of this. We caught you. You won't pay attention. So we elected an orange guy to get your attention. <laughs> and you're still not paying attention. Who are we going to elect next? So it's super important that they pay attention. And with that, I will stop. Thank you. Uh, you mentioned the four-year interlude. You used the word volatility. We have formerly serious people, Senator Feinstein, uh, Eric Holder, questioning the legitimacy of the Supreme Court. Yes, we do. Uh, am I alarmist to be concerned about that sort of thing? I don't think you're alarmist at all. I mean, what we just did, my producer Emily Lynn's here, I think she could confirm, so I think we did 16 leads in a row, first segments in a row on the Brett Kavanaugh confirmation. And we did that because it was a story in the news. It was not the only story in the news. But I found it overridingly significant for the following reason, not because of any personal loyalty to Brett Kavanaugh, whom I haven't spoken to literally since 1998 when he worked for Ken Starr. And, you know, I don't know. I don't know anything about Brett Kavanaugh other than what I read in the paper, and he seems you know, probably not the most conservative guy you could nominate the Supreme Court. So, like, I don't have any stake in this. What I found of critical importance for our viewers, I think for all Americans, was the reaction to that. You have a sitting United States Senator, Maisie Hirono of Hawaii, which is technically a state, <laughs> saying into a television camera without any trace of embarrassment, if you are accused of a crime, it is incumbent upon you to prove yourself innocent. And then I thought, well, I had a lot of relatives in Hawaii and Hanalei Bay. In fact, my grandmother's from Oakland, lived out her days in Kauai. Yay, Kauai. Um, and it's, kind of, it's a little flaky, honestly. And the marijuana consumption, very, very high. So then I'm like, okay, it's Hawaii. Then I see Chris Coons of Delaware, who's so sober-minded and boring, no one can remember his name, looking into a camera and a very precise guy, a law school graduate. I mean, this is not some flaky Hawaiian. This is not Neil Abercrombie's cousin. This is like a real guy. Looking into the, you know, remember Neil Abercrombie? Looking into the camera and saying, that's exactly right, Senator Hirono. If accused, it's up to you to prove you didn't do it. And I'm thinking that's an inversion of the standard that has been universal since Rome, with the exceptions of the medieval period when we had the kind of trial by fire or trial by dunking. Throw him in if he floats, he's innocent. If he drowns, he's, he's guilty. <laughs> like, that's a medieval, te like, this is a threat not simply to the nomination of one guy or the Supreme Court or whatever, but to our understanding, the Western understanding of justice itself. And these are lawmakers saying this. Our children and grandkids are going to have to live here. And if they have to live in a country where you have to prove your innocence or else you're punished, there's no reason to be here. That is, that is the cornerstone of our whole country. That's why people move here. If you're, ask anybody who's just like arrived from Burkina Faso. I'm serious. Why'd you leave Ouagadougou? It's a lovely place. <laughs> yeah, economic opportunity, whatever. But no, in the United States, I'm a free man. And you can't imprison me unless you can show that I did it. And that's the moment when I realized, I guess I am a liberal. Because I remember liberals when I was a kid saying stuff like, it's better that 10 guilty men go free than one innocent man is in prison. And I was like, oh, shut up, liberals. And now I'm thinking, yeah. Because... Punishing the innocent really is the worst thing. And this is not a legal test. This is a human test. This is how you define not simply, you know, whether or not your, your judicial system is on the level. This is where you determine whether you're a fair and decent person. So that's when I realized I'm going to stop getting caught up in a lot of these flashy objects that arise before us. Like, what do you think of this? Or Stormy Daniels. Rawr! Yeah, I don't care. What I care about are the fundamentals, free speech, due process, how we treat other people, 
All of that is under attack by a party that sees only one thing, power, which is its goal, and doesn't care how it achieves it. Now, I don't think this is gonna last forever. Hopefully the revolution will end soon and we can all go back to being normal and not thinking about politics all the time. But for this moment that we're living in, we need to defend those things above and beyond any individual who's been nominated to anything. So anyway, that's a long-winded answer to a short question, but that's how I feel. Hi. Yes, ma'am. Hi, Tucker. Love your show. Thank um, you. I'm from Chicago, and my husband's actually from Venezuela. Oh, nice. And, uh, he's right here. One of the um, impressive Venezuelans I was talking up about. Here. He's the middle class that fled the country. Yeah. Um, I mean, we moved to California three years ago, so we did not grow up here. Um, and we see the changes. When we moved here, we were like, what's going on here? And we see the socialistic nature and the ideology here. The question we have is, who do you think is orchestrating this? Because we see it in the schools. My eight-year-old came home the other day. He said, Mom, is social justice bad? There's like, you know, the, the Walnut Creek School District has oh, can you um, East Bay have a lot of these propaganda posters in the school district. My eight-year-old is asking me this, and thank God for PragerU and your show, because I, I'm indoctrinating them to be conservative children. Good. But who's orchestrating this progressive, socialistic movement throughout our country? That My husband's always asking me that. It has well, to be coming from somewhere. Well, I, Where is it coming I from? I don't know if I, I've, I've spent a lot of time thinking about this, and of course there are pivotal players in all of this, and you know exactly their names, and there are people who are funding it. But I think that a lot of it is organic. What you're looking at is a very large, well, relatively small, but, but in, in terms of the power it wields, a large group of people who have decided that they despise the civilization that made all of, that they have possible. Now there's a psychological explanation for this, which I sincerely believe, which I'm not gonna bore you with, but I mean, it's sort of like, here's the way to think of it, and this may resonate with some people in the audience. You may have seen families that possess multi-generational wealth, and you may have noticed a certain very recognizable pattern, which is not universal, but it's, it's common enough that you'll know what I'm talking about. The first generation, the people who made it, are sort of hard-nosed, smart, focused. Second generation, yeah, that, a little less so. Third generation, honestly not that impressive. Fourth generation, wrapping the Lamborghini around the tree at the club, okay? <laughs> it's that generation that didn't work for what it has, that takes for granted all the things that made its material comforts possible, that tends to be deeply ashamed of its own wealth if you know what I'm talking about. You will almost never meet anybody who worked for 25 years to incrementally build a company and then got rich at the end, slagging capitalism. Never, because that guy earned what he has. But if you live in a world full of inherited wealth, which I do and always have, you will meet a lot of people who are going on about, oh, capitalism. Really? Because you've never practiced it in your life. You're living paying half the tax rate that I pay, because we tax capital at half the rate of labor, as you well know, at my rate. And you're sitting around, you hate yourself, because you're a loser, <laughs> who got your money without putting in the required effort, and you're filled with guilt about it. Multiply that times a whole ruling class. That's exactly what you have. So you never meet anybody like, who came here. For, one of the things I really like, I mean, I think we should control who comes here for sure. But when you see successful immigrants, you never hear them say anything like that. You never hear them going on about social justice. Well, you're married to one. What am I saying? I'm sorry. I don't need to tell you that. Exactly. Because they know how valuable the things that our ancestors built are. That's why they came here, to partake of them. Our justice system, our civil society, our economy. These things didn't arise overnight. People gave their lives to build them. Our freedom of speech. We're the only country in the world with the First Amendment. That's worth a lot, they get it. But people who grew up here and have been bathed in generational affluence are filled with this corrosive, self-hating guilt, and you see it everywhere. So it's not just that George Soros is funding this, though he is, it's that like kindergarten teachers across the country buy into it. And what is the answer? I'll tell you what the answer is, let's not participate in this. I can tell you, I mean, I, you know, let me put it this way, if you were, of any other group, if your kids went to school and all of a sudden the teacher was telling them like, you know, you're bad, your group is bad, you would go in, I mean, if a gay couple showed up at school and the teacher's like, you know, 
gay couples are terrible. The parents would be like, what? No, I'm not putting up with this. In my kids' schools, you know, overpriced Episcopal dumb schools, the parents sit there while the teachers are like, yeah, everything you stand for is terrible. And we're telling your kids that, and the, teacher, and the parents are like, yeah, okay. And by the way, can I have an extra 20 grand on top of tuition, just as a kind of guilt offering? Okay. So this last year, my wife, who's a you know, daughter of an Episcopal priest, very moderate person politically, has been driven completely over the edge by what's happening. And she says to me, I, mean, I always thought my wife's kind of liberal. I've been married 28 years. I never thought of her as conservative. She's like, you know what? I'm not going to use profanity, so I'm not going to say exactly what you said. I'm sick of this crap. I'm not, well, you, know, you know how much you're giving? Zero. Her father's an Episcopal priest. It's an Episcopal school. She's like, nope, I'm not funding this anymore. They hate us. They hate our family. They hate our values. We're opting out. And I'm like, good for you. And by the way, I just can't overstate. I wish you were here so I could like, point her out to you. You'd be like, that's the last person who would say something like that. But she's like, why would we fund an organization that is teaching our children to hate us and our values? Are we masochists? Are we insane? The number of parents who do that, including my family, I just admitted it, without thinking about it or without feeling like they can opt out is like terrifying. I see these parents like, oh, my kid's going to you know, Princeton or whatever, they're all so proud of it. It's like, really, you really send your kid to, do you know what they're learning at Princeton? Is it making them better? I mean, this is in the humanities, okay? If you're going to whatever, Cal to study engineering, you know, God bless you. But if you're going to study, you know, interpretive feminist dance, it's not making your kid better, actually. It's hurting your child, and you're paying for it because you feel like you have no choice. What we need is a growing population of upper-income, well-educated people who say, I've had it. I'm not going to dig my family's grave for you. That's how I feel. I feel like the stakes are really, really high. We lie to ourselves and say they're not high. Oh, it'll be fine. And the last thing I'll say really quick, a mistake that I made is I felt like as a conservative who has a libertarian temperament, I have no desire to control other people, it's just how I'm made, I didn't want to like propagandize my kids. And, I w and my kids are actually, they've been so driven crazy by liberals that all four of them are kind of conservative. Just because I sent them to Episcopal school. So they're like, I, I don't know what that is, but I'm not into it, okay? But I wish I had been more systematic and less ashamed of my own beliefs with my children and sat them down and said, here are the things that we as a family believe. And we're not like everybody else. All the other families of Walnut Creek, they're nice people, but we don't agree with them on certain things, and here's why. I wish I had done that, and we're too ashamed to do that. I can tell you the left does it. Every night at dinner, it's like everyone else is in the Klan except us. I'm serious, and they raise generations of extremists. I don't want extremists in my house, but I want people who understand what our family believes and why we're a little different from everyone else in Walnut Creek or Atherton or wherever you live. There's nothing wrong with that. We should do that. Amen. Ha! Hey. Hey. Hey, Tucker. Uh, Self-deprecation aside, uh, I just want to make a quick comment and then a question. Uh, you are an incredible mind and quite an intellectual, in my opinion, uh, and, and one of the best intellectuals on TV. You know, the, well, the way that that's you, a low bar. You, <laughs> Thank you. Perhaps, but but un, unlike some of the intellectual deep thinkers, uh, you actually add humor to well, yours, you. and you never talk down to people. So that's what's so endearing about well, you, you and your personality, and I just wanted to... Well, I appreciate that. Thank that. you. Secondly, um, I wanted to just ask you a question, because, you know, on this whole issue of Trump, uh, you know, here we have a man that's literally, viscerally hated from Democrats, Ugh. from Republicans, at least, at least half of them, from his own DOJ and spy agencies, from the media, and yet what he's accomplished in less than two years is astounding. And so my question is, is, is there a, uh, I mean, can this just continue, this sort of astounding success with Trump, or is there a sort of a, a, a high mark that, are we at the high mark, or what's, what's your so, opinion? That's a, I mean, that's a, obviously a key question, and I wish I could foresee, I wish I, sorry? I said, Republican in <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I wish I could foresee the answer. In fact, I just had a very, in, the interesting thing about, I, we, I was in San Francisco this afternoon, the interesting thing about this area and about all places where the liberal culture is so overwhelming and oppressive 
is that it makes for a much smarter brand of conservative, I will say. And that's what I always notice when I'm out here, is that the people who dissent from the orthodoxy here have been forced to really think through what they believe. They're not doing it because like all their neighbors are doing it. They're doing it because they really believe it and they know why they believe it, which is so great. And by the way, I see the opposite too. In overwhelmingly liberal areas, everyone's just like, ooh, I don't know. You know what I mean? Like I'm a good person and you're not, right? Right? Okay, yeah. There's something about being challenged that makes you sharper, steel on steel. So I was talking to an ex really smart tech executive secret conservative today about this exact, really secret, trust me, about this exact question. And I asked him, because he's smarter than I am, what do you think is going to happen? And he said, I, I don't know, but I'll tell you one thing, is that things will never be the same. And the reason is really simple, because Trump, whether he can achieve his goals or not, has done the one thing you need to do in order to achieve anything, which is name it. He's named it. And this is why they hate him, actually. Because Trump is the guy who and sometimes in his kind of autistic way will just say it. He'll just say it. And I'm not talking about the vulgar stuff. I mean the obvious stuff. I saw it this summer. We were in, um, in Finland for his uh, summit with Putin. And no, I, I'm not an expert on this stuff, you know, at all. I was a big Cold War guy. I like Europe. I spent a lot of time in Europe. But I'm not, I'm hardly an expert on post-war institutions in Europe. But I've often wondered, like, what, what is the, and I'm not against NATO, I'm for NATO, I guess. I was always, as a child, very for NATO. Because it was, a, of course, a, it was the thing standing between civilization and darkness, right? But the purpose of NATO was to keep the Soviets from invading Western Europe. And the Soviet Union collapsed in August of 1991. I remember because I was on my honeymoon in Bermuda, I'll never forget it. So that was, well, I just said my 27th anniversary. So that was like quite some time ago. So why do we still have NATO? And I thought this because Trump asked it in his Trumpian way. He's like, oh, why do we have NATO? <laughs> and everyone's like, you're a tool of Putin, be quiet. <laughs> and I thought, why is everyone so mad about that? Why are they so angry that he's asking the question? Or I can think of 20 other questions he's asked that infuriate them. And they're angry, of course, for the same reason you're angry when one of your kids asks you a question like that. And the reason is because you can't answer it. Do you know what I mean? And you like try to be a reasonable parent, but they're like, you know, mommy, why are you doing this? And you're like, well, there's a good reason. You know, and they go through the why phase. Well, why? Well, because there is. You know, there's a very good reason. Well, what's the reason, mommy? Mommy wants a glass of wine. Be quiet. You know what I mean? <laughs> That's exactly what's happening. You, because our ruling class lacks self-awareness or humility or empathy, and they do, trust me, they don't feel the need to examine any of their most basic assumptions, even the ones that obviously might be outdated. And so I guess my point is, we're not gonna solve, and Trump is not going to solve, the question of what do we do with NATO? We have this infrastructure. I don't believe in destroying things that could be useful. We can probably do something with NATO, you know, important. But what is that thing? It's not keeping the Soviets from invading Western Europe because there are no Soviets. But now that he has said it out loud, it can't be unsaid. That's the beauty. Once Trump has been like, well, why shouldn't we have borders? Or why shouldn't we build a wall? Everyone Riley was like, a wall, a wall. So I remember I was at a dinner party, I was like, well, why not a wall? Well, because a wall, taller ladders. Okay, but what if you build a super high wall? Oh, be quiet. Okay, well, what's the answer? Oh, shut up. It's like, so there's such, I mean, if you think of Trump, as you should think of everything as part of a continuum, you know, because the, the key mistake that people make is imagining that the future is exactly like right now. It never is. It's totally dynamic. Everything will be different in a year. But if you think of Trump that way, as a marker on a much longer timeline, Trump is the guy who started a series of essential conversations and allowed reform to happen just by naming the absurdities of the way we do things. So it's kind of awesome, actually. So if you think of it that way, as, as my genius friend said to me today, it's like, yeah, he's one guy. He has zero control over his own government, none. They totally ignore him. And he's not from our world. So it's very hard to manage any agency, try like X number of them, three million executive branch employees, like no, all of whom hate him, and they're in a union whose whole purpose is to defeat him? Yeah, probably not gonna happen. But it doesn't need to happen. 
Because once he said those things, we will talk about them until they're resolved. So that actually made me feel so good. Do you know what I mean? And, but, but we're so trained to be like, well, you said you're going to do this. Like, hurry up and do it. You got 12 minutes. <laughs> it's like, no, you don't. You got another generation. Sorry. Question. Yes, ma'am. On how you, how you debate people that you so oppose and you keep your composure and your smile and you're nice. And I was talking with someone tonight that I have a lot of disagreements with and, and we, we kind of did it, but how... How did you do it? How, how would you train to keep your composure on your, your nightly show? Well, I, I don't love always. Your nightly show. Thank you. <laughs> I mean, I just think, I, I think a couple things. One, I always try to remind myself, you know, I've got five hours a week. I don't have to decisively win every debate or crush every, you know what I mean? Like, I don't, I don't have to do that. I don't want to do that, actually. Um, I want to say what I think, and I want to air the other side, and I want to let people decide. I, again, my temp I'm not a libertarian, I should say that, but my temperament is libertarian. Like, I think it's okay to throw the ideas out there, and people can assess, like, what do you think makes sense? What do you think of that? Like, t tell me, what's, what's your argument? I, th I actually think that's my job. That's what I do. Other people have different jobs. You know, other people in TV or in the... How did you learn it? Where did you learn it? I didn't. I mean, I just feel that way. I sincerely feel that way. I don't think, I had a woman on tonight, it was the most interesting segment I've done in a long time, where she came on, she's a well-educated, I didn't ask where she went to college, but I'm sure she went somewhere way more impressive than I did, not that that's hard. I went to Trinity College in Hartford, Connecticut. Go whatever the mascot is. Um, <laughs> but she was a well-educated person, clearly affluent. I can spot that, you know, a mile away, perfect teeth, you know, whatever. And so she's sort of the best that we have. In this, you know, she's kind of like what our society produces at the top end. Bet you a million dollars, or you know, she's from a rich family, obviously. And I said, so she's saying that Susan Collins, the kind of liberal Republican from Maine, should have some honorary degree revoked because she voted in favor of Brett Kavanaugh. And that's fine, okay, whatever. But she said she should have it revoked because she lacks integrity for voting for for Brett Kavanaugh, and I just couldn't get over that. I was thinking about it all afternoon. I was like, so you may disagree with the vote. You think he shouldn't be on the court. You believe, you know, whatever, Christine Ford, or not. But she lacks integrity because she reached a different conclusion from the one you reached? Is that really what you're saying? And she looks right in the camera and she goes, that's what I'm saying. I said, so you're saying that you don't give the people you talk to the presumption of decency? No. Anyone who disagrees with me is a bad person. Oh, what? Wow. That's what they think. I do not think that. I am not them, and I'm never going to be them because that's soul destroying. And I don't care if every person on planet Earth disagrees with me, I'm not going to become that person because the consequences of that are too profound. And by the way, I have a wife who doesn't like it. That's the other thing. <laughs> and so the one thing that my wife always says, she's become, she went from this sort of moderate Republican slash sort of liberal person to like, you know, an intense Fox viewer. All it took was Barack Obama. Uh, it was a high cost. Um, but anyway, uh, but the only criticism she ever levels at me is she's like, don't get mad. You know, you don't look good when you're mad. And I don't know anyone who does look good when mad, by the way. Does, it, does anyone improve with anger? No. Right. And I would say, exactly. So I'd say the last thing I would say is that I also allow, and you should always allow, for the possibility that someone can change your mind. And that doesn't happen a ton since I think about this stuff for a living, but there have been many cases where over the many, the 22 years I've hosted TV shows where someone will come on and say something and I'll be like, hmm, wait, what? I interviewed a vegan the other night, okay? I'm going for a steak after this, just to be totally clear. <laughs> but I interviewed, and I won't get into it, but this vegan guy comes on and I'm like, you wimpy little vegan, you know what I mean? I was like doing the whole like, you know, I want to have to slap you around a little bit, you know what I mean? And this guy totally kept, I basically was mocking him. He totally kept his calm. And he's like, yeah, no, actually, that's not what it's about. It's about animals, and I love animals. And I thought, well, I love animals too. You know, I have two spaniels in my bed every night. He's like, you know, maybe you should think about this if you love animals. And he kind of, and I'm not sure, I don't agree, I'm having a steak tonight, but it was a totally legitimate argument. And he was a totally decent guy. I could just feel it. When you're with someone, you get a very different vibe. So I'm sitting at my desk, I've got all my papers, I'm reading about this, that, or that person. I think, I just, I despise that person. How, how could they say that? And then like one out of five times, I'm like, actually, I kind of like that chick or whatever. That guy's a good guy or what? I, you just get the vibe. 
And I always want to be the person who lets the person be the most important thing. I'm an ideas guy, I'm you know, half of my head all the time, but I want my feelings about the person to play a role because I want people to matter because I want to be humane at the end of the day. So at the end of that segment, I was like, hey, vegan guy, you know, I kind of invited John to be mean to you, but, you know, go vegan guy, kind of. You know what I mean? And I felt great about that. I really did. I like seeing a common humanity. I like learning stuff. There are big issues I've, I mean, big issues I've changed my mind on. I won't bore you with it, but like where someone made a systematic argument to me and, had, and that argument was so powerful that I rethought my own ideas about it, which most of the time turned out to be more reactions than ideas, and I came over to that side. Like, that's what it is to be human. That's why we're not, that's why we're better than the robots that will inevitably replace us, I would say. <laughs> I have time for one more question. Okay. I yes, ma'am. Okay. Uh, first of all, let me tell you how much we enjoy your show. Well, thank you. And, you know, you're, you're really wonderful. Um, okay, my question is this. We used to be a country that was a melting pot. Yes. We have become a country that is a mosaic. Yes, I know. And your show has brought up the point that you are looking into what makes an American. That's right. And I will be so interested to be hearing what you have to say about that. Because, I mean, if, if we're a mosaic, and we're, what is it that makes us an American? That's right. The other thing, uh, just one quick second, that I thought was very interesting, is that you could become a citizen in China, you can become a citizen in Canada, Mexico, but you're not considered Chinese, you're not considered Mexican. Only in America are you considered an right. American. So what makes us an American? It's a great and question. And that is what you're going to answer for us. What's I know so you interesting, are. thank you. <laughs> so and, thank you very much. And this is actually where my Californian upbringing, multi-generational, really, I mean, I can't overstate how much I was steeped in California and its history and sort of the ethos of California in my childhood was very strong. Like we were Californians. And we vacationed in Tahoe, and we crossed the Cal Neva line into Incline, and we'd be like, oh, man, out of California. Can't wait to get back. <laughs> but the thing about California in my childhood was we f people are staying now, I know. It was Nevada then. It's now Nevada, but whatever. <laughs> anyway, my point is the thing about California then was even my family, which was really in its own head anyway, like native Californians, to the extent that they're native Californians, but we really felt that way. We still, the whole idea of California was an idea. And like you bought it, I mean, that's why the West was different from what we called back East, where I now live. Where people were totally like constipated and caught up in their rituals from, seriously, from the 17th century. You know what I mean? Like we were about this idea. And if you bought into California, like, come on, you know, you're one of us. Like all my friends' parents were from like Milwaukee, literally, as you know. There weren't many people at my parents' age who were born in the state. So I bring that set of assumptions to my show, that America is an idea, but in order for it to work, everyone has to buy into the idea. And as I age, I understand the weakness inherent in that system. It can work, but you have to be really thoughtful about it. I mean, countries, you know, this idea, and I took an enormous amount of of criticism for saying it, but this slogan that everyone throws out, diversity is our strength, is a lie. And it doesn't mean, by the way, let me just say, diversity is neither good nor bad. I'm not against diversity, I'm not for it. It's a state that's neutral, morally, but it's definitely not our strength. Is that true in your marriage? The less you have in common with your wife, the closer you are? Are you super close if you don't share a common language? Is it true in your company? Like, no one can agree on what we're supposed to be doing, therefore we're really successful. Is it true in a military unit? It's insane, actually. And so, again, that's not an argument against diversity. I'm not against it. It's just a reminder that if you want to have a country that's cohesive, that doesn't fall apart and wind up at war with itself, you need to find a unifying belief that everyone buys into and new arrivals are required to buy into. And I think the Bill of Rights is a good place to start. And so if you bring people over, 
And the next thing you know, they're like, I don't think we need freedom of speech in this country now. Which, and I've interviewed a million people who've been here about 20 minutes who are lecturing me about why freedom of speech is like immoral. Oh, 100%, 100%. That when the imperatives of diversity and freedom of expression collide, diversity wins, like literally. Those are the segments where I have trouble keeping my temper because it, well, if it's just such an outrage prima facie that someone would show up in your country and start lecturing you about your ancient traditions and telling you they're immoral. First of all, that's just offensive. But more to the point, it's a threat to our existence as a cohesive country. We need, and by the way, this is the job of the ruling class. Like if you're in charge of any, if you're in charge of a family, as I am, then you need to figure out what are, you know, what's, there are six of us. What do we all believe? Like what are our traditions? Like what are we about? What does it mean to be one of my kids? And every Christmas day, we go to a Chinese restaurant in downtown DC, even though we're Protestant, everyone else is Jewish or Chinese, but we go, and that's what we do. Do, do you know what I mean? And that's what it means to be one of my kids. You go to Tony Chang's Mongolian barbecue every Christmas day. And that's a decision I made as the head of my family. Do you know what I'm saying? And my kids are like, what does it mean to be one of the Carlson children? Well, we go to Tony Chang's or like the nine, you know what I mean? And this is what we believe. That's what leaders do. They set the terms for the group. And our leaders, because they are totally inadequate to the job in front of them, have refused to do that. And what you're getting is something whose consequences we will all suffer, which is disunion. So, I mean, in my tiny role as a cable host of one show, I just want to be a voice to remind people that no diversity is, it's not bad, it's definitely not our strength, let's find what our strength is. Ha! Thank you.